These volunteers are stepping up to help India cope with its deadly second wave. This group is building an online database, mapping available medical resources across the country. It's a 24-7 operation. Volunteers need to constantly verify the availability of hospital beds, oxygen tanks and medicine on their phones. We are trying to reach as many people as we possibly can. For that, we need all of you to amplify our resources as much as possible. Many people, even the youngest, are trying to chip in how and wherever they can. It's inspiring to see someone so young getting involved. It gives hope during such a dark chapter in India's history. And it's getting darker. A dozen big Indian opposition parties are calling on Prime Minister Narendra Modi to take immediate measures against the ferocious second wave, which is leaving hundreds of thousands dead. The fires are burning outside. This New Delhi crematorium has run out of space because of the recent spike in the number of people dying. But that isn't the only problem. Many remains of the dead are unclaimed after cremation. And there, too, volunteers are stepping in. During this pandemic, the relatives of these victims abandoned them. Our organization collects these remains from all the crematoriums and performs the last rites for the victims so that they can achieve salvation. The volunteers estimate that 80 percent of the 10 to 12,000 unclaimed remains were victims of COVID-19. Debanjan Banerjee is a consulting neuropsychiatrist and joins us from Bangalore. Uh, you've just finished another hard day's work. Tell us what it's like. Describe for us the situation there where you are in India. Yeah, hi, Ben. Thanks for having me on the show today. Uh, I, I, yeah, I think we are all pretty aware that uh, India is really going through a tough time. Uh, as the second wave of pandemic hits us, the uh, number of cases have crossed uh, 2.3 crores. And every day, I think we are getting news of people affected, losing and lost many of our loved ones, uh, being on the front line. I, a, a lot of my colleagues, myself, we have been struggling to keep up on uh, with the raising healthcare demand. Uh, it's tough. It's tough for all of us. And we just hope that things tend to get better soon. Devanjan, I was Thanks just reading asking. over, over 4,000 Indians died from COVID for the second day in a row on Thursday. What's it like for you personally? I think uh, we are all being affected by this. You know, it's it's a kind of grief that it's unprecedented that none of us were really uh, prepared for. And uh, it's the second wave is far more, uh, you know, dangerous than the first one. And probably uh, we are yet to understand the long-term impact that it's having. But, uh, you know, it's very strange that not even one day passes by over the last uh, few weeks that not, not one of us have been affected with a sad news. Probably somebody hospitalized, someone died, and, uh, you know, all of us have been affected in many ways, more than one. Personally, I think it's really a time that I don't want anyone else to face. But it's, I'm sure it's also a learning for all of us who are working on the front line. You say a, a learning uh, experience. What's the government learning out of this? Because uh, it, its strategy hasn't worked until now. Is it changing its strategy? Yeah, I think, see, as I mentioned, all of us are learning here, and it's been unprecedented for all of us. In fact, the government is made by us as well, and I think they're also in a, in a tough situation. Uh, they have tried certain things, which probably hasn't worked that well. But then uh, there, there has been a recent change in a strategy, mainly a three-pronged strategy. One, containing the infection uh, through measures of lockdown. In fact, I'm speaking to you from Bangalore. Uh, from Karnataka, where we are facing a lockdown till 24th. Many such states are undergoing lockdown to curb the infection, uh, trying to uh, enforce COVID-appropriate behavior of social distancing and respiratory hygiene. At the same time, uh, building up on the healthcare infrastructure to hold on to the raising demand. And most importantly, now that we have started our vaccination drive, the COVID-19 vaccine communication strategy is in place. And we are trying to make uh, maximum availability and coverage of the vaccine. I think the government is trying for that. Well, um, just explain to me what, what sort of a 
Prime Minister needs to be urged from a coalition of opposition parties to act to save his own country. That, that's the news I was reading today. Yeah, I, I, I heard the news too. I think what I can tell you, Ben, is from my own personal perspective as a frontline health worker, and I think there are different uh, public health agencies, national health agencies have also uh, proposed uh, to the government, to the prime minister, you know, as diff different strategies uh, that, that work best, especially in terms of uh, the COVID-19 vaccination and ensuring that there is health equity and equality in healthcare access and especially looking to the safety of the frontline health workers because they will be the main backbone and workforce, uh, you know, for uh, th this ongoing battle. How, how far and, is and, the and, government and with its vaccination campaign? Yeah, so as of on 11th May, the data that, uh, you know, I was going through, 9.9% uh, .9 of Indians have received at least one dose of vaccination and 2.7%, uh, uh, if I'm not wrong, have been fully vaccinated, that have they have received two doses of either Covaxin or Covishield. And, uh, you know, I think in terms of uh, percentages, it's, it's, it looks better. But then what you have to understand is that in a country like India, which is very populous and has a lot of social, cultural, ethnic diversities, getting vaccine, you know, ensuring vaccine distribution and countering vaccine hesitancy are probably the major challenges that we are, you know, undergoing now, especially vaccine availability at all centres. Well, are rich and poor getting the vaccine? Are Hindus and Muslims getting access to the treatment they need? Oh, I think the infection doesn't differentiate based on race, culture, ethnicity, socioeconomic status or religion. So we are treating everyone equal. But of course, you know, certain areas, certain pockets, uh, especially, you know, the homeless, the migrants, the socioeconomically uh, underprivileged, they are facing innumerable challenges in general relation to the COVID. And that includes vaccination barriers as well. Especially, you know, the misinformation has been huge and immense. And there are a number of anti-vax campaigns going on. And uh, there's a lot of hearsay and probably they affect certain classes more than others, especially probably who are in rural areas and not that well informed or in touch with the media. How much more can the country take? How much more can Indians hold out? How much longer is this going to go on, do you think? See, I think the resilience uh, has been immense. Uh, in spite of all the odds, uh, you know, all of us, I think it's, it's a collective responsibility and all of us are in this together trying to fight it out. Uh, just to inform to you that I think the new strategy by the government involves four main important things in terms to fight it. One is the information on the new COVID-19 vaccine, uh, countering vaccine hesitancy, ensuring COVID appropriate behaviors, and also dealing with the COVID uh, vaccine eagerness, because a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of Indians are also very eager to take the vaccine. So I think the key lies in an integrated advocacy, communication, and social mobilization strategy nationwide. Devanjan, just finally, can you offer Indians any sort of hope? Oh, I think so, yes, Ben. Uh, hope is something which, as psychiatrists, we really deal with. And the nation needs hope. Uh, positivity is needed, of course, rational positivity. And, uh, you know, this is probably amidst all the challenges and real opportunity to strengthen our public health infrastructure. So uh, the pandemic will eventually cease. Uh, we all hope. We uh, collectively hope so. And it will actually make us learn a lot of things for the future to prepare ourselves better for such futuristic crisis. Fingers yeah, crossed. John. Fingers crossed you got that right. Thank you very much for being on the show. Uh, great to get your update. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Ben. Take care. Here's an important question now from a viewer about vaccines for our science correspondent, Derek Williams. How long will the vaccines offer protection? We don't know yet. Uh, and even when we do know more, there won't be a single answer to this question since about a dozen different vaccines are currently in use around the world. And since they're made by different manufacturers and are based on a range of different platforms, uh, they almost certainly won't all protect people for the same periods of time on average. Uh, what we can say is that the makers of some of the first vaccines to enter use widely last December 
are now reporting back that levels of antibodies have generally remained quite high in recipients, which is an indicator that those people are still well protected uh, six months after getting their shots. Those results have researchers hopeful that immune response, at least uh, that induced by those vaccines, uh, will last at least a year uh, and, and possibly a lot longer. But developers aren't leaving it to chance. Uh, most have already started modifying and testing the next generation of vaccines, some of which specifically target um, variants of concern. Um, trials involving a third booster shot with them are ongoing. And, and, and don't forget, though there's no sign yet that vaccine-induced protection is, is beginning to wane, even if it does, that won't happen overnight. And even if immunity does start to drop faster than predicted, Healthcare authorities would notice it early, and, and a lot of the experts I've read seem to be pretty confident that we'll be able to respond quickly. And here's a positive sign we're turning a corner. Portugal is seeing a surge in summer holiday bookings after the UK added the country to its safe travel list. British tourists returning from the country won't need to be quarantined. Portuguese hotel operators say demand's growing Business could recover this summer as more countries follow suit. Several European nations are hoping to see a resurgence in tourism as more people get vaccinated. The EU is trying to coordinate plans to allow people to cross borders easily without lockdown restrictions. Thanks for joining us again. Stay safe and see you tomorrow.